Tonight, finally free. 24 hostages captured by Hamas now released as a fragile ceasefire holds. The new images tonight, Hamas video showing Israeli hostages turned over to the Red Cross, making the journey through southern Gaza to the Rafah crossing hours after the start of a four-day truce. The 13 newly freed Israelis receiving medical attention in Egypt before returning to their homeland, greeted by cheering crowds in the streets. 11 Thai and Filipino hostages also released in exchange for 39 Palestinian prisoners held by Israel. Also tonight, holiday cold snap, Americans feeling the chill as they head home from Thanksgiving celebrations this weekend. A record 2.9 million expected to fly Sunday alone. This as heavy snow and strong winds sweep through the plains. Meteorologist Bill Karens is standing by. Plus, Adams accused the mayor of New York City hit with an allegation of sexual assault by a former colleague. The new civil suit filed just days before the deadline in the state's adult survival Act, how the mayor is responding and the other people being accused. Chaos in Dublin, riots breaking out in Ireland's capital, cars and buses burning in the streets, at least 34 people arrested. The stabbing attack that sparked the violence and what we know about the victims, including young children. Dog attacks toddler. The chilling doorbell video out of Texas. A stray dog lunging at a two-year-old and his mother. That mom speaking to Top Story, what she did to get her son to safety and how the little guy is doing now. And Black Friday crackdown, police out in force guarding against those seemingly rampant smash and grab robberies in U.S. cities as the holiday shopping season arrives. And we have your guide to the best Black Friday deals for budgets big and small. Top Story starts right now. Good evening. I'm Ellison Barber in for Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight with that breaking news and a major turning point in this war. 24 hostages held by Hamas now finally free hours after the beginning of a four day ceasefire. New video released by Hamas showing those hostages handed over to the Red Cross in Gaza. The Israeli captives freed today range in age from two to 85 years old, all taken during the horrific October 7th terror attack. The hostages seen traveling in Red Cross jeeps to the border with Egypt, making their way through the Rafa border crossing. Some helped from their vehicles for medical evaluation before finally beginning their journey home to Israel. Israeli Defense Forces releasing this video, which has not yet been independently verified by NBC News. It reportedly shows those hostages crossing into Israel as they prepare to set foot in their homeland for the first time in seven weeks. Israeli forces ready for their arrival with a variety of supplies, clothes, personal hygiene products, even toys for the children among those held hostage by Hamas. In Israel, their caravan greeted with cheers in the streets. Qatari officials confirming to NBC News all 13 of the Israeli hostages have now been reunited with their families. And these are their faces. Among them, two-year-old Aviv and her sister Raz kidnapped along with their mother. They haven't seen their father in nearly 50 days. We'll have his elated reaction in just a moment. Not among these newly freed hostages, any of the Americans believed to have been abducted by Hamas. President Biden addressing the nation today, vowing to get those Americans home. So let's get right to Raf Sanchez, who leads our coverage off once again tonight from Tel Aviv. <laughs> After 49 days of captivity, this is what the road to freedom looks like. White jeeps of the Red Cross driving through the darkness of southern Gaza, carrying these 13 Israeli women and children from toddlers to great-grandmothers out of the hands of Hamas. First to the safety of Egypt for an initial round of medical checks. And finally, home to Israel, where troops gave the kids noise-canceling headphones to dampen the roar of the helicopters. It's only a start. But so far, it's gone well. The youngest hostages, two-year-old Aviv and her four-year-old sister Raz, freed along with their mother, Duran. We met their father, Yoni, on the third day of the war. She told me that they are locked down in the security room and terrorists enter the house. He tracked his wife's cell phone as it headed into Gaza. And then, this heart-stopping video of the moment his family was kidnapped. You never imagine your girls and your wife would fall down to Hamas' hands when they were visiting her, their grandmother. Tonight, Yoni posting, they're finally here at home.
Also free, Ohad Munder Zikri, seen in this Hamas video under the arm of a gunman. His family held a painful birthday for him as he turned nine in captivity. And tonight, American toddler Abigail Moore Idan turns four years old, but remains a hostage. No Americans got out today, but President Biden vowing. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. Also released 11 workers from Thailand and the Philippines who were kidnapped on October 7th. As part of the deal, Israel agreeing to free 39 Palestinian prisoners, 24 women and 15 teenagers. Israeli troops firing tear gas to disperse crowds gathering in the occupied West Bank to celebrate their release. The complex exchange came hours after a four-day ceasefire took hold in Gaza. Palestinians venturing onto the streets after weeks of relentless airstrikes, which have killed more than 5,000 children, according to the Red Crescent. I was displaced to this school because they destroyed my house, says this pregnant mother. And tonight, hundreds of aid trucks rolling into Gaza, a welcome sight, even if it's a fraction of what's needed. Tensions as displaced people try to return north to their homes, but blocked by Israel's army. But for now, the ceasefire holding. And with it, hope for the remaining hostages. Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv. Raf, what do we know about the health of the hostages freed today? And what do we expect to happen next? Well, Allison, doctors here in Tel Aviv say all of the children are in good health. We're waiting to hear more about the adults. Israel's government has also said it has received the list of names of the hostages due to be released tomorrow, which is a sign that this deal is holding. But remember, this deal is only for 50 of the roughly 240 hostages. Allison. Raf Sanchez, thank you. And one of the countries playing a key role in this hostage deal is Qatar. Tonight, our Keir Simmons has exclusive access inside their hostage rescue room, and he spoke with the lead negotiator about when those Americans might be freed. Tonight's NBC News inside Qatar's hostage release operations room, monitoring today's truce at the end of what the lead negotiator describes as an intense day. It's a good day today. Uh, we made a very good progress. And there's hope tonight that a number of Americans will be freed soon. If today we didn't see uh, Americans from the list, I'm, I'm, I remain hopeful that the upcoming uh, days we will see the release of all uh, citizens uh, under the women and uh, children category. So the, the civilian women and children category sure. is what you're aiming for right. in the coming days. That's right. Around 50 and the nationalities the dual nationalities of those hostages, that isn't something that is a factor in who goes first and who goes next. Is that right? True. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is, there is no priority list. We want everyone to, to leave. Our aim is not to distinction uh, or distinguish uh, specifically from one citizen to another based on race, religion or nationality. For us, all citizens matter. The administration has been very keen to see the American hostages released, including, of course, a little girl, Abigail Moradan, who's four today. Of course, it matters to us to get all of the U.S. citizens out. He says the number of releases this weekend may exceed expectations. We're expecting 10 people. Uh, we, we were uh, uh, surprised today by that the number of releases has reached up to 24, which is a very positive development. And you're learning each day from Hamas and in the process who is going to be released and from what countries. We're, we're, every day there is a commitment, as I mentioned to you, and every day there is a new list. Hostage taking is on the rise around the world and Qatar is playing a larger role as mediator. What worries me is that there are other groups around the world who watch this and think they should take hostages as well. But despite their freedom, the captives likely face a long, difficult road ahead. And I think anybody who um, assumes or hopes that life is ever going to go back to exactly how it was before is in for a rude awakening. Jason Rezaian was the Tehran bureau chief for the Washington Post in 2015, convicted by Iran of espionage. He spent 544 days in captivity, for a time even in solitary confinement. Freedom took some getting used to. The hardest thing was getting used to choice again after having uh, my ability to make decisions taken from me. 
Some of the smallest hostages could face the biggest challenges. I think that those kids will have experienced something that uh, it will be very difficult, impossible, for them to put in any kind of context. Israeli health officials, meanwhile, have issued guidelines on proper and safe treatment of returning captives. Psychologist Neil Greenberg says these first days and weeks can be difficult and confusing. Over time, if they have good support, um, then most people uh, begin to sort of recover and, and get to some sort of uh, steady state again. The IDF today releasing video of their preparations to receive the returning hostages, showing rooms full of medical kits. Food will be especially critical since the hostages, including the little ones, will likely be suffering from some level of malnutrition. 24 have come home. Many more remain in captivity. Their loved ones waiting for their turn for some good news. Kier Simmons joins us now from Doha, Qatar. Qatar is known, Kier, for their role as a diplomatic mediator in the region. You were there on the ground when we saw Hamas release hostages for the first time, that initial grouping, speaking to sources. What have you learned this time around about Qatar's specific role in negotiating the terms of this deal? Well, Alison, you speak to the Qataris and they will tell you about just simply being on the phone with one country after another. The Israelis, of course, wouldn't talk directly to Hamas, so they needed an intermediary, a mediator, and that was Qatar. But also they've been on the phone with the Americans. We learned today, of course, how much they've been on the phone with the Thais, because that was a separate negotiation. So an enormous amount of work. And over the weeks, we've seen the whole thing fall down on a very good number of occasions and I think that must have been incredibly frustrating so there is now I think tonight here in Qatar a sense of achievement whilst also a sense there's an awful lot more to do. Could this short-term deal open the door to a longer ceasefire? Well that's the uh, what the Qataris want Ellison I mean that's what they're hoping for frankly that you, know, you build a little bit of trust and then that leads to a peace deal that isn't the message of course that we're getting from the Israelis who are saying they will be back to the war as soon as the handover of hostages is dealt with and Hamas equally saying that they are ready to fight too so in a sense you could say the Qataris are fighting a losing battle but at some point there will have to be some resolution to all this, and the Qataris hope that any trust that they build will be made, will add to that and, and make that possible in the months ahead. Alison? NBC's chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, thank you. Back here at home into the forecast, as a potentially record number of travelers prepare to head home from their Thanksgiving destinations. TSA estimating 2.9 million passengers will take to the skies on Sunday, Millions more expected to hit the roads, but it might not be smooth sailing for everyone with 5 million people under winter alerts. So let's get right to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens, who is timing it all out for us. Bill, what's the latest on the track? Now, the concern is going to be for areas of Kansas, especially people driving in the snow for their first time this winter season and the busy holiday weekend rush, everyone getting home. Uh, that's the issue. So we have winter storm warnings that are up for areas of central Kansas. We're ending our snowstorm in the Rockies. It's been lingering like for the last two days. Denver had a ton of delays today. That was probably one of the worst travel airports in the entire country. So this storm system that is now going to dive to the south is going to kind of split in two pieces. The snow is shown in the blue and the yellow white. This is as we go through Saturday afternoon to evening. So I-35, Wichita to Kansas City, a snowy afternoon for you, especially the colder surfaces. It will stick even on the roads. Then by the time we get to Sunday morning, snow around Chicago, Milwaukee, central portions of Illinois, and then the storm system will head up into the Great Lakes. At the same time, late Sunday, a new storm develops just off the mid-Atlantic coast. And notice the green, that's rain. It's going to spread in from Washington, D.C. up to New York. So all weekend is fine, but Sunday evening, we could have some airport problems, especially in the New York, D.C. area. Snowfall totals, it's not huge, but, you know, if you have to drive in five to six inches of snow in Kansas, that's a big deal. So for Saturday, only issues really in Kansas. East Coast, fine. West Coast is fine. And finally, as we go through your Sunday, that's where we're watching the Great Lakes and areas down along the Gulf Coast, Allison. So we'll think we'll get everyone home. Not too many cancellations, but uh, careful to my Kansas friends. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Bill Karens, thank you.
Now to the new allegation against New York City Mayor Eric Adams. The sexual assault lawsuit filed just two days before the deadline under New York State's Adult Survivors Act. The mayor now vigorously denying the allegation. Melissa Russo from our NBC New York station reports. It is absolutely not true. Vehement denials from Mayor Eric Adams today after he was named as a defendant in a civil suit. I do not recall ever meeting uh, the accuser. In court papers, plaintiff Lorna Beach Mathura claims she was sexually assaulted by Adams in New York in 1993 while they both worked for the city. Beach Mathura asks for a jury trial and damages of no less than $5 million. It did not happen, and that is not who I am, and that is not who I've ever been in my professional life. Who will be representing Thank you? you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The suit was filed just two days before the deadline under the state's Adult Survivors Act, which gave plaintiffs a new window to file sexual assault claims, although the original statute of limitations had expired. The new allegation comes as Mayor Eric Adams is already trying to raise money to pay his new team of criminal defense attorneys with the FBI looking into his campaign fundraising. A search by News 4 New York found several other lawsuits filed under the same name, Lorna Beach Mathura, including an unsuccessful case against American Airlines and another against Miami-Dade County Schools, alleging the plaintiff was abused by a six-year-old kindergarten student. On Amazon's website, we found a book authored by Alorna Beach Mathura offering tips on how to win lawsuits, citing experience fighting in various courts, including small claims, civil, circuit, family, lower appellate, and Supreme Court. In the book description, the advice, never give up. You just may win. We tried unsuccessfully today to reach Lorna Beach Mathura or her attorney by phone and email. And so we were unable to verify that the plaintiff in all these other cases was the same person now suing Mayor Adams. So we need to spend some time giving. We're going to do a few stops today. Serving holiday meals at several locations this Thanksgiving, the mayor vowing to stay focused on running the city during this challenging time from swirling allegations to budget cuts. Mom used to always tell me there are seasons when you know, a lot seemed to be going on. And at that moment, you just got to let go and you let God. That's what I'm doing. Okay. In Harlem, Melissa Russo, News 4, New York. Mayor Adams is one of the thousands of people who have been sued under the Adult Survivors Act in New York. In the last week, Jamie Foxx, Axl Rose, Cuba Gooding Jr., and Diddy have had lawsuits filed against them, all of whom deny the allegations. For more on the act and why so many people are coming forward now, I want to bring in NBC's senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. Laura, can you just explain to our viewers the basics of what this law allows? There's also a time aspect that's sort of relevant for why we're seeing so many right now. The time aspect is everything, and it helps explain pe for people why they see this wave now. So last November, the governor opened a one-year window, which gave survivors one year to file your claims. If it happened even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, as long as you file it within this one year, you can do it, as long as you were over 18. That expired today. And so that's why there was sort of this rush to the courthouse, this flurry of lawsuits that you're seeing right now. Now, some of them happened months ago. You remember E. Jean Carroll, the writer who sued the former president, won $5 million. That was also brought under this lawsuit. But the rush to the courthouse, which is happening right now is because the law is expiring. When you look at these cases, is there anything to take away from, say, the E. Jean Carroll lawsuit, the past ones, in terms of how it will go for other people who have fired these, filed these lawsuits? I think the, the, these cases are always challenging, especially if they happened decades ago because memories fade, witnesses fade. You still have to put forward evidence, right? So these are just the lawsuits themselves. These are still going to be vetted in court. They're still going to have to prove their case, sometimes in front of a jury, sometimes in front of a judge, but they're still going to have to do more than just allegations. And so they can be really challenging. But I think the idea behind them was to say, look, there are oftentimes survivors come forward for all different reasons at all different times. And so this was just supposed to at least allow for that one year grace period. Yeah, that's the question anytime we have cases like this, people seem to ask is yeah. why did they wait so long? And it's been explained so many times as to maybe why the psychology behind people aren't ready to come forward at certain times, not necessarily making an assumption on guilt or not in these cases. But when you look at something like this, are you surprised that there was this massive uptick at the end? Or is this just to be expected based on how long it takes to file something? I think it's to be expected. And I think the real question is whether other states file suit. You know, New York is sort of an outlier here. It's not as if 
that this is a law in all 50 states. New York was sort of at the forefront here, and I think there's a lot of pressure now from advocates saying, look, other states should follow suit, or we should even expand the window beyond a year. We'll see where it goes. Okay. Laura Jarrett, thank you. Switching gears to the millions of shoppers heading out for one of the busiest shopping days of the year. But this year, Black Friday is happening under heightened security amid protests and surging retail thefts. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has the details. Tonight on one of the busiest shopping days of the year at one of the busiest malls in Los Angeles. Pro-Palestinian protesters marched through the Grove before blocking a major intersection outside. And at a mall in New Jersey, a bomb scare forcing shoppers to evacuate before getting the all clear. Merry Christmas! This is the holiday shopping season ramps up. Shopping, <laughs> shopping, shopping. We love shopping. And as police prepare to combat fears of retail crime. Consumers can expect to see an increased presence of high visibility patrols. <laughs> Law enforcement cracking down after the retail industry reports losing $112 billion last year, in part from these brazen, often violent, smash and grab robberies. They just smashed and grabbed. They pepper sprayed me on my eyes and my mouth. Probably about 75,000 people here today. Stephen Craig, who yeah. owns the Citadel Outlet Mall in LA, says several stores here have been hit by organized theft. What's the impact on the businesses? What's huge? You know, you walk into a coach store, you steal $10,000 worth of bags and run out, and it reduces their profitability. The law enforcement presence is visible all around here. That's on top of 24-7 private security, undercover cops, and high-definition surveillance cameras patrolling the area. Shoppers on edge and staying aware. It's like I don't carry, like, a big purse. I just carry this. Again, be aware of our surroundings. Tonight, please coast to coast, vowing to be on high alert to ensure a safe shopping season for everyone. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Today, of course, marking the unofficial start to the holiday shopping rush. For more on the best deals available right now at really every single price point, I want to bring in Wirecutter senior staff writer, Elisa Sanchi, who joins us now with more. So let's just start, Elisa, with big picture. What do you think of the sales that we have seen so far? You know, it's been a little underwhelming, I'm not going to lie. And I say that mostly because it's not that the deal pricing isn't there. It's just that these deals started rolling in like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's not really any different today than it was earlier in the week. Um, you know, normally we hope to see, you know, some some teaser deals earlier in the week and then kind of like jump into more like insane price drops, I suppose. But yeah, everything has kind of been holding steady, which I mean, you know, for shoppers, it means that if you had already started your holiday shopping earlier this week, like you didn't miss out on anything, like you didn't miss out on any lower pricing. If anything, you probably snagged something before it went out of stock. So, you know, it's it's a uh, it's it's a very interesting time. Yeah. OK, so talk to us about what you have seen so far. And if people are like, oh, I already got some stuff earlier in this week, but I do want to get some things today. What are some of the big budget items that wire cutter readers were really enjoying? Yeah. So our readers have been really loving like all of the big um, appliances. So mm -hmm. there's the Breville Smart Oven Air Fryer Pro. That is, it's $320 now, right right now from Amazon. Um, normally it's $400. Okay. It's a really great air fryer and people are loving it. Um, iPads, $230, normally $270. The one that we're seeing on sale from Amazon, it's older generation, but it works if you're just like a casual iPad user. Mm -hmm. um, that coffee maker, the Mocha Master, oh my gosh, all of the coffee fanatics on staff <laughs> love it. They cannot stop talking about how amazing it is. Um, it's 300 or no, sorry, it is $237. It's originally $330. And it is so pretty that I want to, I, I don't need a coffee maker, but <laughs> I, did. I am tempted. <laughs> um, and um, other things we're seeing right now, great deals on uh, suitcases, luggages. Uh, okay. Luggage is so expensive. Like yeah. to get like good quality luggage, it's, you know, you got to spend to get good quality mm -hmm. stuff. And right now, Away is having a sale mm -hmm. and um, Away is like that trendy luggage yeah. uh, 
that, that trendy luggage company that has um, those built-in portable chargers yeah. and those fancy 360 spinning wheels. Um, so now's a great time to to get ahead and uh, and and buy anything that yeah. is really big and on your list. Yeah, I was gonna say a sale on away luggage. It's it's crazy expensive, but as someone who bought one like six seven years ago and travels so much, and those things can take a beating, everything still works. Like I. That is a sale that I would totally take advantage of. Talk to us about things that are possibly good sales that are in a more under $100 type range. Is there anything people should keep an eye out for there? Yeah, um, I actually bought this one myself. Uh, the, right now, the Fujifilm Instant, or it's Instax Mini 12 Instant Camera. So your basic Polaroid-esque uh, camera. I, I already bought one of those uh, mm -hmm. as a gift for my preteen sister, so it makes really great gifts. I hope she's not watching this. Um, we also really love the uh, Bissell Little Green portable carpet. I have that. Um, that thing does work. <laughs> yeah, it works. It works so well. Like, our testers found that they were able yeah. to get out, like, all wine stains, mm -hmm. chocolate stains, perfect for pet owners, people parents of young kids um and you know it's really big on on social media right now so there's a good chance that you've seen like your favorite tiktoker using it to miracle clean their home um we also really love the henley and bennett crossback apron that's a pretty pricey apron even on yeah. sale 79 dollars. like that's not cheap but uh -uh. this is one of those aprons that you know you can see like you if you took a peek into professional kitchens across the country like this is most likely what they'll be wearing it's really like it fits all different kinds of people it's adjustable um and you know it's just such great quality that you'll have it for a really long time okay real um, quick anything under 30 dollars for those at home who are like no not those anything under 30 yeah so and again i bought this one yesterday i bought the apple air tag yesterday it's on sale for 24 dollars right now from amazon and target um it's also being sold as a four pack so if you do want more of them it is better to buy the four pack it's four for 80 so that brings it down to 20 an air tag instead of the 24 price but if you only need one one works I am planning to use this tracker to keep uh, an eye on my luggage during holiday travel. I'm gonna just slip it in my luggage, check my bag, and if it doesn't get to my destination, at least I have the peace of mind of seeing mm -hmm. it on my phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when people are looking at these deals, and I know you said you were a little underwhelmed by some of them, if someone is thinking, oh, well, let me just wait till Cyber Monday, should they just go ahead and get something now, or could we see even bigger deals on Monday? I think you should go ahead and do your shopping now you're better off getting the deal price than waiting for it to drop lower and risking it running out or like the deal expiring or, you know, stock running out. Um, you're going to want whatever it is that you want and you're going to be more upset that you missed it completely than if, you know, it does happen to drop a couple more dollars between now and Monday. All right. Wire cutters, Elisa Sanchi. Thank you. Still ahead tonight, the latest on that deadly explosion at the U.S.-Canada border. What we're now learning about the two people inside a car that crashed into the Rainbow Bridge as the Thanksgiving travel rush was underway. Plus, police in Chicago searching for the suspects behind a dozen armed robberies in just one hour on Thanksgiving Day. The warning for residents who live in the area and a surge in respiratory illnesses in China, leaving the country's hospitals packed with sick children. What parents here in the U.S should know. Stay with us. We're back now with a developing health headline out of China, the country grappling with a surge in respiratory illnesses and clusters of pneumonia, and it appears to be impacting young people the most. NBC News visited Beijing's Children's Hospital yesterday and saw waiting rooms crowded with parents and children, some of them on IV drips. It appears hospitals in northern China are overwhelmed by sick kids. According to the World Health Agency, Chinese health authorities did not detect new or unusual pathogens, but they are now asking Beijing for more data. For more on this and what it could mean here in the United States, I want to bring in Dr. Akshay Sayal. Uh, Dr. Sayal, explain to us, big picture, why a surge like this, that term pneumonia clusters, why that would be so worrisome for children? 
So, Ellison, a, lo a lot of us here got word of this actually a few nights ago. We, we started seeing reports on Twitter about, about a lot of clusters of children getting sick in hospitals. And, you know, there's two things that could be causing this, right? Are we back to 2019 and 2020 where we have a new virus? Or is it a lot of the old stuff? Is it a bunch of that stuff sort of accumulating? And the WHO, the World Health Organization, has been in regular communication with Chinese authorities. And it looks like it, it, it's a combination of things, right? It's flu, COVID, RSV, and, and one people may not have heard of, mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, it's a bacteria that can cause what we call walking pneumonia, meaning you don't tend to get as sick as, a, as other pneumonias. And it looks like it's, a, it's a, essentially a cluster of all of those hitting at once. Um, remember that China just lifted their, their COVID restrictions. So what we think is that, you know, a lot of people were used to wearing masks, maybe had uh, not, you know, flexed their immune system as much, uh, especially in kids and all of these things sort of hitting at once, kind of like the triple demic a few years ago here. So given that China has so recently lifted their COVID restrictions, that means more people can travel in and out of the country. For people who are looking at this in the United States, should they be worried that this could possibly come here and we could see a bigger a grouping of kids with RSV and other seasonal illnesses. So, you know, we're seeing more and more people traveling as more and more people get more comfortable in, in relaxing some of those restrictions. So, you know, I do think that some of this is going to spread. But, Allison, these are bugs that we know about. These are bugs that have treatments. These are bugs. It's not a new virus like a COVID. So, um, you know, even if these things were to keep spreading and spreading, you know, in China right now, the, the WHO was actually interviewed today saying they're not at capacity, meaning they still have tons of hospital beds. Yes, there are. There are a lot of, you know, children going in, but they're not quite at the level that they were at COVID. Um, so while, you know, travel may bring those things here, the reality is those things are already here. So we have the treatments and the tools to, to fight them if needed. Okay. Dr. Akshay Sayal, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Anytime. Turning now to Dublin, where riots erupted in the Ireland capital, the capital of Ireland, rather, overnight after three young children were stabbed near a school. Nearly 500 protesters burned buses, cars, and looted stores. Reporter Stephen Murphy from our partners at Sky News has more on the chaotic evening. Sunrise in Dublin, and the damage became clear. City workers started a massive cleanup operation in the small hours. This was unlike anything seen here before. Those involved brought shame on Dublin, brought shame on Ireland, and brought shame on their families and themselves. They're filled with hate. They love violence, they love chaos, and they love causing pain to others. Three buses were burnt by the rioters. At least 13 shops were looted. Eleven Garda vehicles were destroyed. Dozens were arrested. Numerous police officers were injured, one seriously, in a night of extreme disorder. The scale of the rioting and the destruction it caused is pretty much unprecedented here in Dublin. The police simply lost control of sections of the inner city for hours. So the question today has to be asked, was this a policing failure? There's no failure. This is uh, regrettably how protests have moved on and now we have to graduate and have a proportionate response to that. The rioting stemmed from a horrific daytime stabbing attack at a primary school in the city centre. Three children aged five and six and a teacher in her 30s were injured. A five-year-old girl is still critical. The suspect was subdued by passers-by and remains in hospital. Almost immediately, online speculation about its nationality was amplified by right-wing anti-immigration figures. The fire had its spark. The influence of the far right in Ireland is on the rise, according to a research body. So really what we've seen, and especially over the past year, is a huge increase in mobilisation coming from far-right groups and their ability to kind of root their way into communities across the country and to get people onto the streets, mostly by spreading fear and hatred and often just blatant lies and misinformation. As the clean-up continues, the Irish government has pledged to modernise hate crime legislation within weeks. The police will review its public order tactics. This riot, a lesson in the weaponization of fear into incendiary anger. Stephen Murphy, Sky News, Dublin. When we come back, the dog attack caught on camera, a stray dog going right for a toddler. The child's mother then jumping into action and trying to fight off the dog. What she told Top Story about the split second decision she made to get between that dangerous animal and her son.
We're back now with Top Stories news feed and new details on that deadly car explosion at the U.S. border with Canada. As we reported on Wednesday, a car going at a high rate of speed crashed at the Rainbow Bridge, bursting into flames and shutting down the area for hours. The two people inside the car have been identified as a couple from Grand Island, New York, just near that border. They were both 53 years old and reportedly owned several businesses. The exact cause of the crash is still under investigation. A manhunt underway in Chicago after a robbery spree on Thanksgiving Day. Police say they believe the same group is behind 12 robberies that took place within one hour on the city's south side. Police say in each attack, two, of the four, two to four men approached victims with either a black handgun or a long gun, demanding their property. They reportedly took off in a blue sedan. No one was hurt, but police are urging residents in the area to stay on alert as they search for the suspects. Overseas convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will be released from prison in South Africa. The former Olympic sprinter was granted parole 10 years after he fatally shot his girlfriend through a bathroom door at his home. Pistorius, who is a double amputee, became eligible for parole after serving half of a 13-year sentence. Upon his January release, he will need to take an anger management class and cannot travel for five years at least. And back here at home, an update on fruit pouches for children uh, that may contain lead. So the FDA, they say it has received 52 reports of children consuming lead from apple puree pouches, up from 34 cases last week. The reports involve children between one and four years old across 22 states. The contaminated pouches were sold by national grocery chains, Dollar Tree and Amazon. We have more information on NBCNews.com. Now, the Texas mother sharing her harrowing story with us, a stray dog attacking her toddler right in front of her. The whole thing caught on camera. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky has that report. A horrifying dog attack caught on camera in Texas. Shantae Wright Haywood pulling her two-year-old son CJ from the jaws of a stray. And I just... I couldn't even process what was going on in the moment. I just knew I had to get him from under the dog. The dog running at CJ as they were leaving their home before Shante scoops him up and spins him away. The dog keeps lunging at the toddler, chasing the pair right up to the front door. I just figured if I'm between them two, there's definitely a chance he can bite me, but he's not going to get a hold of my son. Get Shantae able to shield CJ as the dog jumped up and snapped at him, eventually able to hand him off to his sister waiting inside before escaping into the house herself. But the dog wouldn't let up, breaking the door off the hinges and pushing to get in. It's coming. The kids are putting their... Um... Uh, body weight up against the door and I have my foot planted on the door like right behind the uh, frame of the door. The dog retrieved by the sheriff and animal control leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. A potted plant shattered in the doorway. CJ suffering a bite mark on his abdomen. His mother says he's still dealing with the trauma of the attack. I feel like he may be a little traumatized. Um, he's he's playing fine with his siblings, but every so often he'll kind of stop and like point at his stomach and say, doggy, dog, dog, dog. And like, you know, like he's kind of just like thinking on it. Dog trainer Shelby Samel says when a dog attacks, do your best to stay calm and use nearby objects to shield yourself. If you have any food on you, you can actually toss it or throw it. Um, if you know that there is a stray dog problem in your neighborhood, it might not be a bad idea to have some hidden in your pocket or your purse. Shantae's now using the incident to call for accountability for dog owners in a neighborhood where stray dogs have become a constant nuisance. Without him, our family wouldn't be complete. I just like look at him and I'm like, oh, Lord, thank you for just protecting him and just giving me strength. For her family, a sigh of relief that she was able to rescue her son. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. Coming up, a feel-good story any way you slice it. A California couple with two fruit vendor stands bringing their skills to TikTok, how their content is boosting sales and earning them fans around the globe. We're back now with the Americas and the TikTok success for one California couple. They're fruit vendors originally from Mexico, but they've been sharing their slicing skills on social media. And now business is booming. 
Hacienda Boulevard in La Puente, California. You'll find El Ninja, a fruit vending business selling favorites like sliced watermelon, coconut, and mango, with homemade chamoy, of course. Hola, señor, ¿cómo está? But the owners behind this cart are not just known by locals. Alejandro Isabel and his wife, Daniela Benitez, have amassed nearly one million followers on TikTok, thanks in part to their incredible knife skills. Pues realmente la idea fue de ella. The couple telling NBC Los Angeles that Daniela started gaining followers on TikTok while sharing makeup tutorials. And that is when she had the idea to start promoting their business, which includes two carts in two different locations on social media. Y mucha gente se empezó a sorprender por la manera en que en que lo hacemos, por la manera en que lo hacíamos, o cómo pelábamos, cómo preparábamos. Their videos taking off, Alejandro jumping from just 30 viewers to 20,000 on his third live stream. Y fue como, wow, esto es Es muy bueno para mi negocio. Those new followers also translating to new customers too. Ha habido gente nueva que me ve a mí y me dice, oh, vine porque te viene live y se me antojó la fruta. The couple who are both originally from Mexico also sharing videos of their personal lives, including with their children. Their content reaching followers from all over the world. Agregándole un poco de de nuestro de nuestro ser, de cómo somos, de, de buena vibra, tratar de que la gente este pues se divierta un rato en mi live. Videos bringing a smile to the faces of those who watch them online. And it appears it's good for business too. For Tom Yamas, I'm Ellison Barber in New York. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.